Thank you all for coming this morning. My name is Howard Burns. I'm the editor of NJ Biz, and I want to welcome all of you to the Business of Cannabis panel discussion. This morning, I would like to introduce our moderator, Scott Rudder from the New Jersey Cannabis Association. Mr. Rudder was named president of the board of directors for the New Jersey Cannabis Association, president in January of 2017. NJCBA is New Jersey's first and largest trade association focusing exclusively on developing and growing the cannabis industry in a sustainable and responsible manner. Scott is also a partner at Burton Trent Public Affairs, where he represents clients on a range of businesses and issues including transportation, cannabis business strategies, entertainment, and energy. In addition, Scott is a former New Jersey State legislator and mayor with Fortune 100 corporate experience as well. In addition to his 16 years in elected office, Scott has worked in several senior staff positions in government organizations. So I'm about to bring Scott up. I just want to mention that our hashtag is NJBizPanels if you're going to tweet this. And with that, let me introduce to you Mr. Scott Rudder. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you? What's going on? Talking about cannabis today, huh? So let me give you a quick update on what's going on in Trenton, and I want to I want to hand it off to our panelists who are subject matter experts. So you know, as Howard mentioned, I'm a former state assemblyman, former mayor. Um, I spend most of my time talking to my former colleagues at the state and local level, talk about what cannabis legalization might mean, how it could impact our communities, how it may impact our constituents. We talk about the business side of things. We talk about the social side of things. I will tell you that it's uh, it's not an easy task when you you know when we we get a lot of folks who are really excited about cannabis legalization. Then you walk into a room with somebody who's not thought about it at all for their entire lives and what legalization might mean. They they've been taught like we've all been taught that cannabis is something that's you know same thing as heroin or cocaine and all these other bad things. We put it all in one basket, and, and we're only recently learning, relatively recently learning, in the past few decades. Cannabis is a wonderful medicine. Cannabis is healthier than alcohol. Healthy, can, uh, cannabis is healthier than opioids. Can, cannabis is healthier than lots of things that we don't think about. It's healthier than sugar. It's healthier than caffeine. So from a business side, as people are really gotten to start to think about how I can integrate my world into the space, we, people are often talking about licensing and so forth. But the real opportunities are also in the ancillary business as well. I talked to a lot of folks in security, and we have folks in marketing and so forth. So everybody's trying to gear up. When is this going to happen, Scott? When are we going to see the real industry take place? So there's uh, debates been going on. I know Governor Murphy, everybody knows Governor Murphy ran on a platform of legalization and, and expanding medical marijuana in New Jersey. Um, his, his objective initially was, hey, can we get a bill passed but in the first 100 days? And then that sort of shifted to the right to uh, maybe June 30th. And now we're hearing some rumblings that maybe June 30th is not, is not the deadline. I still believe we can do it. The reason why we're talking June 30th is that's the day, the, that's the, when the budget is due. Uh, so our fiscal year ends June 30th. We want to get uh, revenues uh, projections in the budget. So he put $80 million in next year's budget for cannabis taxes, tax uh, revenue. So $60 million for the adult use side, $20 million for the medical side. So right now, the focus has been on the medical. So uh, Governor Murphy, as most of you know, did some expansions on, uh, through his executive order, uh, adding new conditions, uh, at allowing the current operators to expand their operations, talking about new RFAs, requests for applications, that may be hitting sometime soon for those who are interested in, uh, in that uh, part of the uh, industry. So those are things that are going on right now. And then the other day, we see a, a new legislation that was introduced, Senate Bill 10 sponsored by Senators Vitale, Scutari, and O'Scanlan. That, for you folks, I would tell you, go online, look up S10. If you really want to see what the forecast is going to look like for the cannabis industry, what legislation is going to be used for the medical side, that's the bill to look at. Senator Scutari is also working on the adult use side, and he's working, we're building momentum there as well. And so you're, you're going to see new, uh, new legislation introduced uh, soon, amendments to his current bill. So there's a lot of different activities going on, and there's nothing that's guaranteed. But I do believe in my heart of hearts that what, two things are going to happen. One, we're going to see significant expansion of medical. Great news coming out of there. I'll let some of the panelists talk about some of the attributes of that bill. Um, and then adult use. So if it doesn't get done by June 30th, I feel very strongly. I talked to, to the Murphy administration on a regular basis. I talked to my former colleagues in the legislature on a regular basis. 
and they all believe if it's not done by June 30th, it's definitely going to get done this year, and so that's our main objective. So with that sort of background, I would like to introduce our panelists. I want to introduce, I'll start with Dan McKellop. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan McKillop. Can you hear me? Okay. Is that all right? Good. Okay. I want to thank NJ Biz for putting together a great event. As you can see, the interest is, is definitely out there. This is happening. Thanks for Scott for the intro. I want to congratulate Scott on getting through his introduction without using any cannabis puns whatsoever. Uh, it's a growing industry. It's a budding industry. I already got that. Right? Yeah, a, Let's be blunt. We can get lost uh, in the weeds. You know, we're going to blaze on through. Okay. We'll just get it out of the way. Uh, I'm, I'm the serious <laughs> one up here, Dan. <laughs> Sorry, forgot. I, <laughs> I'm counsel at Currency Hollenbeck. Uh, we're located in Lyndhurst. We have offices in Manhattan and Red Bank and a couple other places. And I head up our cannabis law practice. Uh, full service practice, full service firm. Basically, we are one-stop shopping for all our clients, including our clients in the cannabis industry. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the background of the industry, both on a federal level and then bring it here to Jersey. I'm going to talk a little bit about the medical uh, legislation and the recreational legislation. We'll talk a little bit about employer-specific concerns uh, with respect to employee testing and protocols and handbook policies and things like that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm John Pelletieri. I'm an equity partner in the accounting and consulting firm of Grassi & Company, where I head up our firm's healthcare services practice. We work with physicians, hospitals, outpatient facilities, and cannabis businesses as recently as the last two years. Um, that's been a growing part of our business, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, how we help our clients, we work with them on traditional accounting, back office accounting services, tax planning, financial statements, um, and a lot of strategic planning um, on the cannabis side, certainly working with mergers and acquisitions, um, cost accounting, inventory control, cash management, some of the issues that are going on in this space. Uh, currently, we're representing um, in the cannabis space dispensary owners, landowners, um, technology companies, consumer goods um, in a number of various states, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Florida, Oregon, California, and Colorado. Um, we got into the space last over two years ago. A um, couple of different ways we got into it. Working with physicians, we realized our clients were starting to ask us about it in New York. We have medicinal cannabis, and some of our primary care doctors were talking to us about it. So <clears throat> as their advisors, we thought it was a good idea. Let's, let's get into the space. So I did my research. And ironically enough, contemporaneously with some clients asking about it, I had some family members that uh, were asking me about it. They had some, some of the ailments, you know, one particular aunt had Crohn's disease and, you know, was, was, was struggling with two things, A, the pain, and then B, I think, the appetite and, you know, that being suppressed. So it really made me think and really start to dig into it. I did some research, um, understood the industry was certainly changing at that point. There was probably six states that were medical, you know, into that, and then certainly on the recreational side. So it was a, it was a uh, investment that the firm made. We believe in, in the platform. We certainly, on the medical side, uh, we think there's a lot of uses for it. We're very bullish on the industry. And it does come with, you know, some of its pitfalls, you know, from an accounting and tax side. We'll get into that. You know, cash management's an issue. Taxes is an issue. But all these things are right now obstacles that I think over time are going to evolve. And we'll get into some of the stuff that we're starting to see. You know, um, I think, as Scott said, politically and, and you know, getting that momentum is, is really important. And, and that's how I think we're going to see the, the change happen. And certainly from an advocacy standpoint, you know, everyone here, you're obviously interested in it. Get in touch with your congressmen. Get in touch with your legislatures. You know, make a difference. That's how the change is going to happen, and that's how we're starting to see it happening. So I, I thank Scott and NJ Biz for the opportunity. I look forward to an engaging conversation today. Good morning. Jim Benninger from Veritas Security Group. Uh, we are a Pennsylvania-based security risk management company specific to the cannabis industry. Uh, Veritas has uh, been in, in, the, in the space for about two years. Uh, it's been a spinoff uh, of our... Uh, parent company, which uh, we've been involved in security for uh, probably nine nine years or so. Uh, the one thing that Veritas offers, and you, you kind of stole my tagline of one-stop shopping. Thanks, I appreciate that. But we are we offer anything uh, in regulatory needs um, and operational needs from from security, uh, from application development uh, to physical security technology to policy procedure development, emergency crisis preparation, uh, 
boots on the ground, uh, transportation needs. Uh, so anything that you as an owner would need within the regulatory compliance space of uh, the cannabis world we can offer. Uh, my background, my partner's background, and uh, please don't throw things, uh, 20 years of law enforcement as a drug officer, and uh, came over after a lot of education on my part on the benefits uh, on the medical side. Uh, I am a true believer in the, the power of the medicine, um, or we wouldn't, we, you know, we wouldn't be here. Uh, but uh, we bring a lot of experience to the, to the table on this. Um, and what I'd like to talk about today uh, as part of the panel is getting your team together early in the process and not waiting till the bills out and the regulations are out and uh, how to build that team and get, you know, get some subject matter experts on board so you have a winning application and you know, you're guaranteed licensure. You know, I, I have a... Uh you talk about that, Jim, with your, your past experience in law enforcement. In 2009, I, I was a sitting state assemblyman, and we were debating uh, the CUMA law, the, the Capacity Use of Medical Marijuana Act, at the time. And I got to tell you, it was a really, really difficult uh, decision back in 2009. A lot of people, obviously enough people voted for it. A lot of people like myself abstained on the issue. Because at the time, in 2009, we weren't quite sure this is the right thing to do, this is the right direction. And I know a lot of folks up here wrestling with that themselves. Like, you know, is my firm, should I go into this industry? And so I, I guess I'll just toss out, a, you know, so, so I'm going to conclude my story. In 2013, I met with uh, Vivian Wilson and, and, and Brian Wilson. They talk about their daughter, Megan, and she suffered from Gervais syndrome, and she was dealing with two to 300 seizures a day. So in 2009, I abstained on the bill. In 2013, now we have a new bill in front of us that's going to allow new conditions, adding new conditions in for children as well. So the, as a legislator, I'm talking to, 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 to Vivian, and we're both, you know, tears in our eyes. We're talking about our own kids, and it became a very personal issue. And as a politician, I thought to myself, well, who the heck am I to get, you know, in between a doctor and a mom and a daughter? So, you know, that was an easy yes vote. And I think those votes become easier as the more we learn. And so I'll just toss out a simple question to, to the panel here, because I, it may be germane to what's going on out here. How did you guys get into this position? Now, Dan reached out to me early last year. How did you guys get into this comfortably? Or did, was it a little uncomfortable in the start? I, sure. No, good question. Um, it, it's simple, frankly. I mean, I'm a lawyer. And three years ago or so, I suppose, two and a half years ago anyway, I saw a headline come across the wire that one of the states out west had gone legal. And it, it had come on the heels of other similar headlines. And this one, for whatever reason, grabbed my attention. And I sat back in my chair and I said, well, wait a minute. How are they doing this? This is totally illegal under federal law. I don't understand this. <clears throat> I understand a lot more about it now, as you might imagine. But that, that was kind of what kicked it off for me. It was, to a certain extent, uh, extent, it was the increasing coverage of the marketplace and the industry by mainstream media. Um, it was the fact that multiple states were now seeing their way clear, at least within their own borders, to say yes to this through various mechanisms. And it seemed to me that this was a trend that wasn't going to do anything except speed up uh, and continue and, and, frankly, make its way across the United States from the West Coast to the East Coast. <clears throat> All that being said, New Jersey, obviously, the most densely populated state in the country, especially in North Jersey, 20 million people within 10 or 15 square miles. This seemed to make a lot of economic slash political sense. Um, so really, it started with me being curious, frankly, um, sensing perhaps that this was going to be a business opportunity for the business community in New Jersey, and then really just starting to educate myself. I mean, we heard a minute ago, that's how it starts. You start reading about things, you start learning more, you start making connections with people in the industry. One, some of the first phone calls I made were to lawyers in the cannabis space out in firms on the West Coast in Colorado, and just literally picking up the phone and picking their brain, saying, listen, I'm in Jersey, we're light years behind you guys in a couple different respects on this industry and its development, but I think it's coming, and I'm just wondering if you could spend some time, you know, with me on the phone and answer a couple pretty high-level questions. And, and to their credit, almost every single one of them spent a lot of time with me. So to the extent that, you know, a lot of people are here to build your team, that makes a lot of sense right now. This is the, probably the best use of this time that you can make of it uh, before the laws hit the books, before the regulations hit the books. Yes, you need to know what they say. You need to get a sense of what they say and line yourself up you know, the, that way logistically. But it also is hugely important to get to know the folks who are in this industry, especially now at the beginning, because 
It's the folks who learn early that are likely to be more successful. That's uh, I have a similar experience, Dan. I'll, I went into sort of the, um, my client got into it, I had a family member into it, and then as we started to do the research, as Dan just referenced, um, being in healthcare, <clears throat> what I've noticed over 25 years is a lot of trends in healthcare start out west. <clears throat> you go back 25 years ago, managed care. Managed care was going on out west in California, and I talked to doctors in New York, and they go, eh, it's not gonna happen, don't worry about it, we'll be fine. Fast forward, that, that happened. So I, I do view the West Coast in healthcare as trendsetters. So um, two years ago when we started going into it, as Dan said, I reached out to some colleagues I had out in Colorado and in California to understand the market, understand the pitfalls, opportunities. <clears throat> and I think coming from an entrepreneurial firm at Grassi and Company, we're always looking for the opportunities. So I looked and said, there's not a lot of people in the space. There's a, there's a good clinical reason for this. It's really healthcare related. And by the way, it, it looks to be a booming business and, and I'm not so sure the train is gonna stop at this point. So now I made my business argument, I have to go to my executive committee and present this to them why we wanna get into the cannabis space. Now, the, the problem with that is federally it's illegal. Um, and as an accounting firm, auditing financial statements, not something that we have to go about you know, very cautiously and do our homework and we reached out to our state society, our organization, our governing body that oversees what we do, and, and we reached out to them, and we got some guidance, and we made the uh, we made the step to get into it. And you know, it was uh, as we do anything, we go in full force, and it was a great opportunity. And you know, we we like to think we're early in the game, and and we we do believe, you know, as our panelists, I'm sure everyone here, that it's going to continue, and uh, the momentum I believe is just starting, and I don't think it's too late to get in. Uh, this is going to be a big industry. If you look at tobacco, you look at alcohol, 90, million, 90 billion, 120 billion, these are large industries. This one, the end of 17, anywhere from 9 billion to 12 billion. I just saw in the Wall Street Journal the other day, they had 12 billion, I'm not sure. If that's as large as I've seen at this point. But the point is it, it's growing, and if you look at the trend over the last couple of years, it's growing, and I'm sure we're all doing a lot of speaking. I spoke last year at this conference, and we had half the room here. So every conference I go to, it's encouraging. We go to national conferences, local, there's momentum. So the more we're talking about, the more you come out to you know, support these things, it's a, it's a great opportunity. And uh, I look forward to the rest of the afternoon, uh, morning, sorry. All right. From a business point, I will say this was a no-brainer. We, uh, we work in a, a few highly regulated industries from uh, healthcare to, to government. Um, and when I first, uh, broke into the cannabis industry, uh, was working with a firm in Illinois, uh, writing the security plan. I knew nothing about it back then. Um, and when I, we brought it to uh, the owners of our company, it was the same thing, did the presentation. Where I struggled, again, was more personally rather than um, from the business side. Um, after 20 years of law enforcement, I can't tell you how many doors I kicked or how many people I've arrested. Uh, because of this, and now the personal struggle is, okay, you know, I was operating on what I knew at the time, but like I said, the education piece for me was, was huge. Uh, and what really changed my mind was a woman named Heather Shuker from uh, Pennsylvania, who same thing, her daughter, horrific seizure conditions. And uh, she kind of spearheaded the Pennsylvania program and, and, and got, uh, got the legislation signed and her daughter is doing wonderful, wonderfully now because of the, the medical part. And to see that and see the, the positive benefits, you know, it's, it's to me now a no-brainer as far as the, the medicinal side. Um, it, it helps people um, and the reason <clears throat> it is a Schedule One is because all the research was done on why uh, cannabis is bad uh, instead of looking at the why is it good and you know, and uh, so, so what we're starting to see more states come on board with a clinical research license. You know, teaming up with uh, universities and uh, med um, teaching hospitals to, to to find out, get some good hard data, so we can say, hey, told you so. Um, so, like I said, mine was a personal struggle, Scott, rather than the business businesses, uh, no brainer. So. And I think that's what it is. So even as we make a business decision, we still have to wrestle with it. So, you know, how many people have been to a cannabis panel uh, meet and greet or something like that in the past year or so? Wow, good, good amount. So the people that are the people that are deciding to get into this industry, you know, 
part of it is that struggle. Is this okay? You know, I have a 17-year-old, a 15-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 9-year-old. And I've been very out front on what daddy does for a living. And I've been very out front that, that cannabis is a medicine first. And I've been very out front on the dangers of using cannabis as a teenager. So there are things that we have to do from an educational perspective to, for, within the community with our own children and so forth. But when you actually put it up against other things like alcohol, you know, 88,000 people are going to die this year from alcohol-related deaths. 485,000 people are going to die this year from tobacco-related deaths. Zero people will die as a result of using cannabis this year and last year and entire the history of the United, uh, the entire history of the world. Okay, so there's there's this thing, and there's a stigma, and we're powering through it. And so I really appreciate how many folks have been here or here today this morning, but also you know gone to a whole bunch of these other events. And the more we talk about it, the easier it gets for other people to get engaged in the business. So speaking of business, Dan, what would you recommend to get someone started in the in the cannabis industry? You need to have knowledge, and you need to know people. Okay, that that's where we're at right now. Scott was talking about it before the, the legislation that's, that's uh, going through Trenton right now. It's very, very important to have a decent understanding of what those bills say. They are just bills. They will change. There's multiple bills in play on both the medical and the recreational side. But they do contain some fairly uh, detailed information, uh, at least in broad strokes, about what, for example, is going to make up an application for a particular type of license. What are the components? They even have some percentage breakdowns on what you want to be looking at, your business plan, your security plan, your community services component. It, it gets into a fair amount of detail that you can be actionable on and at least start getting your ducks in a row right now. Obviously, again, and we keep coming back to this, but it's one of the most important things to be doing right now is to be building your team. If you have expertise in one particular aspect of the cannabis industry, if you have all sorts of retailing expertise, for example, in, in other, other uh, non-cannabis businesses right now, and you think that you're going to be able to make the jump to the cannabis industry as a retailer, that's fine. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to get to know folks who you may end up becoming contractual partners with. You want to know folks who are going to be looking for grow and processing licenses, and maybe you create your quote-unquote team that way. Now, that's getting a little bit far down the field. Um, we're still working with draft bills, as I said. We haven't had regulations promulgated, much less issued yet. So you need to come up to speed with what the legislation says, what it means for you, how you can start getting your ducks in a row. You need to build your team. Obviously, capital is a huge component of this. It's very, very expensive to get into this industry, and it always will be. Uh, there are going to be robust background checks on everybody who seeks to enter the industry, especially with respect to where your funding is coming from. Because, and I think we'll talk about this in, in a minute here, one of the big concerns about this industry, of course, is the money laundering aspect. Uh, the, the federal government is very keen on making sure that folks who may enter any of the respective states' individual legal cannabis programs aren't doing so in order to achieve a money, money laundering effect. And I'm going I'm to let the, the subject matter experts on that get into more detail on it. But long story short, from a business aspect, it, it's... I often tell clients that are looking to get into the space, think about this as an ordinary business. What are you going to have to do for an ordinary business? You're going to have to line up your money. You're going to have to line up your people. You're going to have to line up your real estate. You're going to have to line up your infrastructure, whatever that may mean for what you want to do. And then, by the way, you have to layer over top of that normal business process the fact that this is not a normal business and this is cannabis. And it comes with its own set, its own layer of worries, yes, and concerns. But also options and alternatives, and that's where we help our clients. John, what, what do you, what's your take on it from a you know, tax perspective and how people can start to uh, position themselves from the get-go? Well, I think first you're going to want to do your research and understand <clears throat> what part of the industry you're going to want to be in. Um, certain parts are more risky than others. Um, if we go back, you know, to the uh, gold rush, you know, if you look back then, the people that really were the winners were the ones that made the picks and shovels. So I think you got to understand what your risk is, and obviously the risk you take, the more riskier, the greater the reward, um, but it comes with some downfalls and some pitfalls. Um, if you're looking to go into the industry, I'll, I'll, from a tax perspective, when we talk about it's very costly and capital intensive, um, because federally it's illegal right now, um, the IRS tax code only lets you deduct the cost to produce the product. Now, that may sound great, but at the end of the day, what that 
prohibits you from deducting from a tax perspective is your salespeople, your insurance, your legal fees, your accounting fees, um, meals and entertainment, um, every other non-cost of goods sold deduction you're not going to be able to take advantage of. So what that effectively ends up doing is brings your effective tax rate from right now this year, top bracket 37 percent. Without getting all those deductions, you could be looking at a 60 to 70 percent tax bracket. So very, very cash intensive for the long term, all right? Um, right now, it costs a lot to build it. Have the capital, the team that Dan referenced, as well as my, you know, um, that's going to be really important in what you put together. That's going to help you get whatever, if you're looking to get a license, that's going to be critical. Um, surrounding yourself with the right people, knowing where you want to get into, and, and certainly you know, looking at, from an investment perspective, if you're going to invest rather than operate, understand the tax aspects. That, that's real important. And the other thing for businesses is you're not able to bank um, any of your revenue in a traditional bank. So it's very cash intensive. There are banks out there. Um, few and far between, but very costly to do it because if the banks are going to bank your cannabis business, at the end of the day, they're, um, you know, they're committing a crime at the end of the day. So they've got guidelines they have to follow in order to be able to take your cash and you'll be able to have checking and credit cards and access to all that. So it, it's really something you, you want to do your research, surround yourself with the right team, ask the right questions. And it just be a, a knowing participant in the, in the business. Yeah, and we don't know what the, the regs are going to look like as of yet. Um, we have an idea possibly from other states. But, to, but once we have that idea is to read those things to the T, um, understand them. Uh, one horror story I can give you, a client that we work with uh, found a location, got buy-in, public buy-in from, from the town. They were uh, want to build in and move their, their facility in. Um, spent tons and tons of money with build outs and you know getting ready to go and they were within a thousand feet foot of a school okay so understand what's in the regs understand where you can build um, you, you're right we, we have to look at this as a regular business but there's a, a huge blanket over this regu regular business with the regulations know those regulations know who you can hire know their backgrounds your investors backgrounds um, this is a very heavy, you know, how do you get $2 million, $2 million uh, your first year in the cannabis business? Yeah, start with $7 million in the bank, absolutely. <laughs> you know, so you, you want to have to have that capital up front um, to, uh, to, to get this off the ground, and it's, it's not a cheap process. You know, we look at uh, regulatory requirements just on the security side, uh, and I'll give you Pennsylvania. We just finished phase two last week uh, for the Pennsylvania applications. Um, the security requirements were intense. I don't know if anybody is familiar with uh, video storage and what you need to, to, to store video and how, how, much, how big your server needs to be. Pennsylvania is requiring four years of stored video. Four years. You know, you're looking at petabytes worth of information, so you're, you almost have, have a room that stands by itself just to, to, to hold those servers. Um, Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey right now, I think uh, the last I saw maybe was 30 days, which is great. Because um, if you don't know if you're having a problem within those 30 days, you know. Right. You got a bigger issue. You got a bigger <laughs> issue, right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, is, is you know, bring the, bring the folks on that know, know the industry, um, know the specialty parts of the industry. You know, um, just as a little side note for myself, if anybody wants to hire me, my bachelor's degrees in horticulture, so I'm a security expert and a, and a horticulture. No, <laughs> that's that's, a, that's, a, that's not fair. It's a win-win, right? I know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's like winning. No. But anyway, so, yeah, I hope that. Yeah, no, that's good, Jim. Yeah, we're, we're all proud of you, too, buddy. Thanks, <laughs> No, I, well, you know, it's interesting. The, uh, you know, the, most people in this space right now, that you know, you, you know, as John mentioned, you know, the, the money doesn't necessarily have to follow the license, right? So, there's a lot of folks, you know, well, we got three folks right here are making some parts of their living off the cannabis industry, and they don't have licenses in the cannabis space necessarily. They're using their subject matter expertise, their existing businesses to enter that space. So I actually highly encourage people to do that. But I, I just to toss up question to anybody here. The challenge is on the ancillary side, are, are you getting pushback in your industry? I'm, I'm gonna st I'll start with Jim. 
you know, some of your folks that uh, I know you're looking at as a business opportunity, but, you know, a lot of law enforcement folks in this space now. And, and what's the, you know, aside from the, uh, you know, the business side, I mean, what's the change in law enforcement are you, are you talking to or just, you know, societal shifts that you're experiencing? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and, and we've seen a, a shift in, in law enforcement, um, not only because they had to because of the changes in the laws, but we're also seeing, uh, you know, f folks like my partner and I, the education piece, we're educating them. You know, for, for years, this was bad, you know, and we didn't know any, anything better. Um, so we're, we're starting to see uh, folks change. I mean, just from, from a legal aspect, um, you're seeing a lot of changes in the laws be because of this. You know, I'll give you a great example is, you know, plain sniff or with, with, with a dog, you know, a drug dog. And drug dogs are probably going to go by the wayside at some point because, guess what? It's legal now. So um, you know, just uh, legal aspects like that are you know changes uh, on the law enforcement side, or uh, we're seeing things change daily. Um, new case laws coming out. So, um, but as far as protecting our business and and you know. There was hesitation, reputation control, because we work in other verticals. How are those other verticals going to look at us working in this space? Um, and, and to protect those other verticals, what we actually did was spin off another company. We did just for the liability exposure and, and you know, separated the other company out. So um, we, we do have that clear separation there. John, I don't know you want to go and do a deeper dive on the banking side of things. I think that's where. You know, so so we're we're you know New Jersey Cannabis Association. We're a trade association, right? We don't touch the plant. We use words. We advocate. We're education. And when we first tried to set up a bank account, uh, we were denied. And then the second time we went in, uh, we got our bank account set up. And and three months later, I got the, uh, the certified letter saying that uh, thank yeah. you, but no thank you. Uh, now we're at a bank. It's a very small bank. It's a very small institution, but we have a bank, and that's great. John, what, what are you thinking? What are you seeing? And how can people employ different strategies? Well, right now, any federally chartered banks, uh, for the most part, won't bank any cannabis clients. So that now you're limited to potentially credit unions or state chartered banks. Um, those are, you know, right now, those are the options. There are a handful of federally insured banks that will bank. They're not advertising it out there. So trying to find them is like trying to find a needle in a haystack which is, it just doesn't make sense to me because you want it bankable, you want people to come to your bank, but you're not letting people know it. they're keeping it a secret right now for whatever reason. But if you are able to find that bank, um, it's very expensive to bank it there. But it's, you know, to me, you don't want to be walking around with wads of cash. There was, again, an article in the New York Times on, on how much cash is floating around and what people have to go through. They've got to go to quasi-check cashing machines when they have to pay their payroll taxes and have them put $20 bills in a slot, and it takes three hours. It's completely inefficient. Um, and, you know, fortunately, I think the politically, uh, they understand how inefficient it is. A, because it's a cash system, you're losing taxes. You're losing control of the whole system. Um, I think federally, you know, um, Secretary Treasury Mnuchin is, is – taking it seriously. He's trying to come up with, with a, a, a platform that will work, but government just struggles. This stuff is moving quick and they can't get out of, no disrespect, Scott, but you know, uh, it just takes time. I'm sorry. It's, Good it's, night, everybody. Thank <laughs> you. Great question. It, it's not you. It's the no. system. It's the system. <laughs> no. But, but, but that's a big, you know, that's a big part of the problem. And, you know, we were, we, we do a lot of, um, we're very active uh, advocacy in this space. So we were at a fundraiser last week, two, last week in New York with um, one of the um, congressmen, very, very pro-cannabis and sponsored a number of bills and is part of what they call the um, Rohrbacher Blumenauer Amendment, which in essence prohibits the federal government from using federal resources to prosecute uh, cannabis businesses, state cannabis businesses. And, and th they understand this is a big problem and they're dealing with it. And you know, s some people would say the idea of taking it from a Schedule One drug, which right now makes it federally illegal to a, a Schedule Two or a Schedule Three, that would certainly help. They're talking about even bypassing that and, and descheduling it. So that would be a huge thing, and, and that would be something that they could do at the government level. The, the people don't have to vote on it or anything. 
So they're, they're really thinking about it. But right now, it, it's an issue. So, you know, safes, security businesses. Jim's going to be your best friend, plus he's, a, he's an ex-police officer. So, you know, to have someone like that. And Especially it, when you're standing at that cash machine feeding 20s in for, I mean, <laughs> talk about security risk, you know. And, and it, it's so nice to have, a, you know, ex-law enforcement on the panel because yeah. this is a great advocacy. You know, for the longest time, you know, we're... We heard, again, you know, say no to drugs and it's this and all the crime that goes on. You've got someone here saying it, it's not the case. You've got a lot of people that are incarcerated that shouldn't be for petty crimes that mm -hmm. at this point it's costing, you know, the state money. It's wasting our police officers' time. Look, in New York, they're, they're just putting forth a bill um, to start decriminalizing it. Now, um, the irony of that is, and this is why getting the states to get on the bandwagon, more states to get on the bandwagon, you know, New York and Governor Cuomo was anti, anti, anti-cannabis until the people basically came to him with a ballot and said, look, you really don't have a choice at this point. So he made it incredibly difficult in New York. He went there begrudgingly, okay? Now what we're starting to see, he's getting competition from, from other people looking to seek office. It's a hot topic right now. So it's the wave is starting to change in New York. And look, at the end of the day, I believe their motives Whatever their motives are, it's probably financial because New York is not going to sit back and watch tax dollars go over the bridge to New Jersey while they just collect their easy pass. That, that just doesn't make sense. So I think all that right now, you've got the, the, the banking is an issue. There's options. But you know, I think we're going to start to see the change over the next couple of years. And, and I would suggest if you're going to get into it, bank, pay the fees, do it the right way because the, the alternative, it's, uh, it's just too risky. I, I, but just to touch on the scheduling, just for those who don't know, cannabis is a Schedule One drug, which means there's no medical value and it's highly addictive. Crack cocaine, however, is a Schedule Two, so it's fine. So it has some medical value. It's, so I guess what we're trying to say is there's no science behind this. There's no science behind the designation. That was a political decision. There was no research. There was no patient study that said, oh, my goodness, it's highly addictive and there's no medical value, because if there were, those things in place, we wouldn't be having this discussion at all. So, so Dan, when you're advising clients on the conflict between state and federal law and how to get themselves set up correctly, what do you what do you tell them? You, it it kind of goes back to reading the regulations. It's that kind of idea. It's that look, here is the setup under federal law. <clears throat> it is illegal under federal law under the Controlled Substances Act to have anything to do with cannabis, just in general terms. You're, Buy, you're, sell, you're use. a criminal enterprise. Yep. Exactly. That's exactly. Bottom line. And so, as a result of that. Since 1970, it's been federally illegal. Well, then all of a sudden in 1996, California, again, a West Coast state leading the way on the healthcare front actually, goes legal on the medical side. A bunch of states follow, okay? New Jersey, 20 not, or 2010, legalizes medical marijuana use. Then it starts coming over to the recreational side. 2012, Colorado puts in a recreational program. More states follow. There are various things that go on on the federal level. In 2013, there's a Cole Memorandum. James Cole issues a memorandum from the DOJ, which basically says, we see what your states are doing out there within your respective boundaries. We don't have the manpower to kick down all the doors out there. As long as you guys comply and, and don't undermine these eight federal enforcement priorities, don't give it to kids, don't let it get into organized crime, don't send it to states where it's not legal, a few more, we're basically going to take a hands-off approach. And that's what kind of carried the day for several years. More states legalize on recreational. More states legalize on medical. Uh, now, and more recently anyway, the beginning of this calendar year, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III, our Attorney General from the great state of Alabama, <laughs> rescinds the Cole Memo. And that was a very long day for me and probably for Scott. I talked to Scott that day, actually. This was January 4th. And everybody was a bit freaked out. And in the end, it wasn't as big a deal as people feared it might be. He basically designated all the attorneys general in, this, in the United States, 90, all the 93 of them, with their own prosecutorial discretion, whereas previously it had been located in D.C. with the DOJ and kind of command and control. Now he decentralized it. Okay, so that basically means business as usual. States continue to do their thing. New Jersey obviously starts talking in more depth about expanding medical and legalizing recreational. Obviously, Governor Murphy, very big proponent. They're expanding the medical program as we speak. There are, there's legislation that we've been talking about on the recreational side. So the long story short is, in advising clients about the federal-state conflict, yes, it's illegal under federal law. And what that means is you better be complying with every single semicolon of the state law. 
because that's your saving grace. You're going to be able to say, we are in strict compliance with every single regulation that our state has put out in this industry. And as such, because of states' rights issues, we are allowed to conduct this business within the boundaries of the state of New Jersey, and we're doing it the right way. So the long story short is, do it right. Do it right. And by doing it right, what I mean is you do it right under New Jersey state law. Absolutely. I, I'm going to start a little, the Q&A a little earlier, I think. I, I think what we – is that okay? Because I'd like to get some questions up here, and then we can go back to the sure. standard questions. Go back. go back to the panel. But I, I want to make sure we're, we're engaging the, the audience a little bit more. And uh, sure. Dan's Just awesome. but. All right, so questions, questions, questions. We have questions. Let's start with the closest one right here. I got Mike over here. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Dan and Jim with all of this. Regarding employees, obviously it's a cash business. Can I have a current company? Can I set my current company up with my employees and push them over to the cannabis side? That's number one. Number two, do I have the alternative to use a PEO service? professional employer organization to handle the employees and pay them, so certainly you want to pay payroll taxes and do it the proper way because of, you know, there's a lot of good things to do it that way. And Jim, this question's for you. Talk about being within a thousand feet of a school. Is that K through 12 or do university campuses kind of tie into that thousand feet as well? And then we can continue on and go from there. I'll, I can address the, the cash issue and the, the scenario that you laid out, unfortunately, is how people are doing it. It's a problem. Right? You cannot put employees of this cannabis touching business on one of your other entities and pay it through there. Um, you know, you may get away with it for a good amount of time, but if if you ever get audited and the pro propensity to believe that because there's so much federal tax that's going to be gained by this, you're probably going to be audited. It's, it's not wise to do it that way. You could definitely have a problem. How about a PEO service? Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. You wouldn't be able to deduct it. Um, you'd be able to pay your payroll taxes that way, but from a deduction standpoint, you, you're going to have a problem if you try to deduct it, and then if they ever sift through it and find out how you're doing it, you, you could definitely have a problem. So do you, is the payroll tax being done after the fact, or how do you do the employee the taxes and everything else? You pay your employees in cash, and then you go to this this check cashing place, for lack of a better word, that you deposit the cash and then it, it sends it to the government for your taxes. Okay. Yep. All right. Yeah, as, far, as far as the schools, that's going to be uh, within the regulation. So there's going to be definition of what a school is. Some states have schools listed even like playgrounds, um, can be uh, nursery schools. So there's going to be defined out within the regulations what a school is. Uh, and it's broader than just K through 12. So that's one thing that uh, we've seen too, people looking or looking for spaces and you have a playground within that thousand feet. Well, that may fall under the regulation of the school. So, uh, you know, depending on what the New Jersey regs say, uh, may include universities and colleges. And just to follow up on that one point, and this is getting kind of granular, but from what I understand, the thousand feet is actually property line to property line. So it's not structure to structure. Right, thousand feet. It's the closest point on your property line to the closest point on the school's property line. So the private institutions or private nurseries may fall underneath that regulation. They might. Yeah. yeah. It, and it also, it, so the state regulations will have some guidelines, but you're also going to deal locally, right? So you're still going to deal with your local planning and zoning boards. The local officials will still have a say. And don't forget, too, there's still the those towns that are opting out and trying to stay out of the cannabis world and all that kind of stuff, which is kind of silly. You know, it, you know for example, uh, Colorado, 70% of the towns in Colorado opted out. Right. They did $1.5 in sales last year. Colorado Springs, who opted out uh, several years ago, they did an analysis. They lost $20 million of tax yeah. revenue to their neighboring municipalities. $20 million. Guess who wants to opt back in? <laughs> But it, a lot of it's going to be local Absolutely. control as well. And, and on that point with local control, start that process now. Yeah. If you have an idea where you want to set up shop, make those connections with the head honchos, the, the, the municipality, um, mayors, board councils, mm -hmm. you know, supervisors, so or whatever works. you got. Take them out to lunch and sell. Sell yourself. Yeah. Why is this a good idea? Police chiefs. Police chiefs have a bunch of concerns. 
you know, not only is it, is it going to bring the, the, the stoner crowd in, but what is the security risk? Is it going to be a, a target for robbery? Say, hey, we got these great security regs that we are doing everything that we can to mitigate an event from occurring here. Um, and let them in, let them help you, let them feel like they're helping you because there's buy-in then. So start that process early with uh, the municipalities. And, and I think you'll find, though, you know, again, statistically speaking, and not just in New Jersey but across the country, wherever cannabis dispensary pops up, crime goes down. Yep. That's a fact. And, if, and, and so I also encourage people, you know, mayors, when I'm talking to my, again, my, my former colleagues at the local level, you know, I encourage mayors and chiefs of police. We have five mayors and five chiefs of police that are dealing with cannabis businesses already in New Jersey, soon to be six coming up. You know, those, the, 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 our biggest concerns are never really realized in, in this space. And, again, I always encourage people to talk and get those facts because, because of all those security protocols. And, by the way, you don't see those same security protocols outside of a CVS where they actually yeah. have opioids. You see this inside uh, um, uh, medical marijuana dispensaries because it makes other people feel better. It's not necessarily needed. Okay, so it's one of those extra things. Not, no offense, Jim. But, no, no, no. Uh, but it's, that, no, it's not. It's not. But it's fear and emotion. It's you know, not being educated. It, 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 so, and, um, you know, and statistically, you're right. You know, and, and and not to get off topic, but like school shootings. Everybody's upset about school shootings, but statistically, they're they're low right now. Believe it or not, the lethality is higher when we're having an event, but. You know, the, the fear that it's going to happen is based on emotion because it's, it's they're bad. Like, one's too many, but we're not seeing it with the, the marijuana industry either. We're not seeing that crime happen, you know. And crime goes down. Crime goes, crime goes down. Goes down. Yeah. And, and I, I think also Colorado's done some studies. The fear was you're going to have more children doing it. They're going to have more access. And the, over... The period of a few years, they've actually seen no increase in use among younger children. That, so you're seeing a decrease. You, yeah. In, in 2000, in 2013, Colorado yeah. had the highest teenage use in the country of marijuana. Yep. Highest teenage use, and now they're number seven. It's a downward trend. In fact, across the country, we've never sold more cannabis in the United States than ever before than we are right now. We're at a 20-year low in teenage use, and that's not our numbers up here. That's the United States Department of Health and Human Services numbers. They've been doing a, an annual survey every year on substance abuse, whether it's where you're talking about opioids, alcohol, cocaine, caffeine, tobacco, cannabis. And they've been doing this study since the early 1970s. And what they've determined in the most recent study that was released in 2017, we're at a 20 year low. It's because of regulations and education and enforcement. Question. Uh, Alex I'm a CPA up in North Jersey. Uh, it's about the declassification. Um, if it gets declassified or if it gets classified as a type 2, my understanding is that the FDA gets involved. Um, there's a theory out there that if you leave it right where it is and maybe get an exception for 280E and get the banking regulations, what are your thoughts on the FDA getting involved and how much more side effects and things are going to come into play as they do in the pharma business now? I would personally love to see that because I, I, we really need to get the research going and yeah. we really need to get the clinical data out there. So um, the issue with the FDA, I just I want to get it declassified. One, two, two doesn't even help us is the reality of it. But I think if you declassify it, uh, the research, you know, and the, I want to get the FDA, but let them do the research. Let's really understand because, look, all this sounds really good. And I could, you know, we all have stories. Look, epilepsy, little children. It's changing people's lives, but we truly don't know the other side of it. So I think it's important. You know, right now, it sounds like a great idea. Right now, we've not heard no deaths, no addiction, no, none of these other problems that come. But let's do the research. Let's really become informed. If we're going to go full force into this, let's not let what happened in tobacco, most importantly, right. skew this opportunity. We're at a, what I'd say, a tipping point in society, especially on the clinical side, um, let's understand it. Let's not repeat what tobacco did, and let's do it the right way. Yeah, to that point, I mean, one of the, one of the really sort of insidious and aspects of being scheduled on Schedule 1 and sort of the catch-22 of it is it precludes research from being done right. on it. So we're lagging way behind, just to go national for a minute, international, we're lagging way behind Canada, way behind Israel as far as research goes. And in ignorance, there is fear. Right? We don't know what it is. We don't know what it can do. We don't know how it can help. And so therefore, you know, I grew up in the just say no generation. That's what gets 
pound it into your head and you believe it, it becomes part of the social fabric, and it's hard to get over that. And we're struggling through that right now. So if it is declassified, which I, I do think you know is going to happen eventually, it is necessary, I think that's a good thing for a lot of reasons. Uh, the most important of which is we get to learn more about it. We get to learn about it from independent people telling us what it is, what it isn't, and therefore we can make decisions. In the spirit of learning from past history, could you go into a little more detail about what mistakes to avoid from the tobacco? Could you specify that a little more? Look, there was clinical data that existed how addictive it was from the beginning. And no one wanted to talk about it, but that, that's what I'm talking about. Look, we see what's going on in the opioid crisis. This is no game. You know, These things are highly addictive, and yet doctors were convinced by salespeople that there was a 1% chance that these people were going to be addicted, and that was the furthest from the truth. So I want to know, what are the downside? Then, every, look, there's going to be downside with everything. There's, there's unintended consequences. Let's just get it all on the table. Put the money aside. Let's, you know, the money will be there once we do it the right way, but that's what I intend. They, they, it was a billion-dollar industry that they took advantage of, and we see the, the results of it. And to me, I think they knew exactly what they were doing. And not only that, we want to know what the downside is for sure, but we also want to know what the upside is, right? I mean, that's the other part of that coin is that, you know, the Israelis have done a phenomenal amount of research, to, to Dan's point, you know, phenomenal amount of research. The Canadians, the Germans, there's just so much information that's out there, scientific data, but because it wasn't done by the FDA or approved by the FDA, we don't utilize it. So when the, when the head of the DEA comes out and testifies before Congress and says there's no medical value, he knows that's not true. He's just right. qualifying it by saying, as approved by the FDA. Good news, though, right? So the FDA just came out uh, within the past month about their, their pending approval for CBD uh, drug, yeah. right? So two main components, many, many components, 100, 100 different components to, to the cannabis plant. But TAC and CBD, cannabidiol, are the two main ones talked about. And CBD oil is what we're seeing for seizure disorders, what we're seeing for Parkinson's and they just approved something along those lines. So we're getting closer, we're inching there all the time. And, and you talk about Israel and Canada. Um, there's a lot of non-FDA testing going on to really start genetically designing some of these combinations and components of this plant to target specific ailments. So once they can start doing that, and, and the results have been you know, nothing but stellar, you know, targeting certain types of tumors, crazy stuff that you would say, it's a freaking plant, how does it do that? But, but, but that, that's the reality of it, and that's the power of it, and that's really where I'd like it's to see the research. Not just helping on. the symptoms, but finding the cure. Absolutely. Right? I mean, that's, that's an amazing thing. So yep. let me toss, I know we, we're open up the audience, but let me toss a question out here because it's relative to what we just talked about, which is from an employer's perspective, right? So we're designing, we're, we're, we're expanding medical marijuana in New Jersey. We're, we're, we're talking and de debating about going into the adult use market. So employers are always discussing, how do I deal with this? You know, I have a federal contract, I have a local uh, business, uh, you know, and, and they operate uh, dry cleaning and there's heavy equipment in there or something to that effect. Dan, what, what are you advising employers? Sure, I, we have a lot of our, our non-cannabis clients asking us, you know, we see medical being expanded and we see recreational on its way, but more immediately we see medical being expanded. It's easier for patients to get in, it's easier for doctors to participate. The market's growing as we speak, 100 new patients a day, I think, for the last yeah. three weeks or so. Yeah. Um, and so there are concerns on the part of employers who are in non-cannabis industries. How do I address this? How do I handle a situation where we do a random drug test because we are required to do so or we just elect to do so? And lo and behold, it comes back positive for THC. And then we have this discussion with this employee, and the employee says, well, I'm in the medical marijuana program. How do we handle that? Well, the first, the answer is it starts with your policies, your employee handbook, your SOPs. There is no requirement that businesses in New Jersey uh, offer any accommodations, is the buzzword, for medical marijuana patients. Now, what does that really mean? They, they're, they're not required to allow the medical marijuana patient, their employee, to ingest their cannabis at work on the job site. They certainly are not required and, in fact, are prohibited in a lot of cases, heavy machinery, for example, from allowing any individual employee to operate that kind of stuff while they're impaired. Um, and short, regardless of impairment. Re regardless of impairment. And so it becomes a real question of trying to get out front of it by having a very, very clear employee policy 
and handbook and communicating that to your new employees. Here's the situation. It gets more specific with respect to each individual business and what you're doing and how you do it. But on a general level, it starts with, frankly, and yeah, here comes the pitch. It starts with calling your employment lawyer. It, it starts with a discussion there saying, look, I know this is coming. It's going to come This up. is a paid advertisement by. <laughs> <laughs> Be in the back. Uh, but that's how it begins. That's how it begins. You want, you want to solve the problem by avoiding it in the first place, really. That's the easiest way to do it. And no matter what business you're in, no matter what industry you're in, it's going to affect you. We, as I say, the medical program is expanding leaps and bounds. I mean, at this rate, in my mind, in another year or two, there won't be anybody in this room who doesn't know somebody in the medical marijuana program. They added five new conditions two weeks ago or so. Anxiety. Okay? That was me on the drive down here. <laughs> so anxiety is a qualifying condition. And as we could tell, Dan medicated as soon as he got it. Yeah, and, and I feel fine. Um, That's funny. But the point being, it, you know, the medical industry was, has been, or the medical side of our industry here in New Jersey has been very, very small for the last eight years for a lot of reasons. Political reasons, yes, but a lot of other reasons. And now the aperture is widening like this. And it's going to happen fast, and it's happening fast. So to the extent that you've had situations arise on the medical front with an employee that you want to avoid again, to the extent you have questions about, well, what is it going to mean when yeah, I do have this issue, it starts at the beginning. So get your handbooks in order, get your policies in order, understand what the law says, obviously, because that's where it starts. And like I said, the best way to solve the problem is to avoid it in the first place. It, it, the, the one, the one uh, industry where almost every state that has come on board has missed the boat on is uh, geriatric health care, CCRCs. Um, the issue with that is you have um, personal care and skilled and you may have folks in there that are patients. And how do you regulate, store the, store the drug within the CCRC? How do you get the electronic medical record if their doctor is not an approved uh, marijuana physician? Um, what kind of diversion issues could you possibly have within the facility? Who brings the drug to the patient, the caregiver? Um, who does that transfer? Um, so, you know, from a regulatory compliance piece, uh, health care, uh, specifically, like I said, geriatric, is, is problematic. And almost every state has missed the boat on that because all the pre-qualifying medical conditions you're seeing within that, you know, that population. And if you think about it, that population was how old back in the 60s and probably was a consumer back then. So, uh, we're, you know, we're... We, we're seeing that as an issue too, but how, how do we get the, uh, the people, the medicine that they, they need within these uh, healthcare facilities? I think just <clears throat> piggybacking on the issue with the drugs in the workplace, you know, it's there was an article Colorado put out. I read, and there was there was some of the employers at this point aren't even testing anymore because th they'll have to go out of business because they couldn't find anyone that hasn't smoked now, or, or consumed, I should say. Now, the inherent issue there is, look, um, you don't want people being high at work, you know, I mean, you have contractors, you have a lot of anyone. So what I would say is people in the audience will go back to my original statement on where the opportunity is, picks and shovels, um, come up with a drug test for cannabis that's reliable, that can talk about what's happened in the day because THC stays in your system could be 30 to 60 days. So you may have done something 60 days ago. You get drug tested today, you're going to get a positive. Um, this goes for driving. Look, there's people out there that are, you know, my law enforcement friend could attest. Um, to me, that's where an opportunity is. You want to look for gold? You come up with that cure. All I would ask is just remember where you got it from and just call me. <laughs> that, that's, that's all I'll say. Hashtag John. <laughs> right, right. You know, that, that there is that, that is the billion-dollar opportunity, right? And so there are different technologies that are being deployed, and they're looking at swab tests and things like that. But I think also, in addition to that, the trend is, is not the drug test but the cognitive test. You know, they're looking at how I can judge impairment based on how you can do pass a, whether or not you can pass a cognitive test. And so they're looking at that, too. So the trend is actually going away from the drug testing to are you impaired, yes or no. The one problem with that is, unfortunately, I had friends that went to MIT and they had no problem with it. They were very focused. <laughs> yes, it does help. Uh, when it comes to licensing, what sort of competitive advantages do you think uh, disabled veteran-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, uh -huh. local uh, 
President, what sort of advantages do you foresee in the bill? Sure. Uh, there, there are provisions in the draft legislation right now on that very point. And the language is a little bit wiggly. It basically says, for example, I, I think on the medical side, it says the Department of Health, which oversees the licensing program, um, shall seek to ensure, I think is the language, that a 15% set aside, I believe, for minority-owned, women-owned, veteran-owned. I'm sorry? Objective. Objective, exactly. Objective. So, so there is, you know, that sort of consideration being made. Similar consideration on the on the recreational side. There, there is some fairly pointed, at least draft language to that end. Yeah. Pennsylvania had a, a whole section just on diversity, and that scored very heavily within the application. Um, so, you know, you had to show a diverse business, and uh, you got some big points on that. The scoring on that. So, a lot of states are putting that provision in. Good morning. I stepped out for a second. I'm interested in CBD oil as a supplement in my juice manufacturing company. And I'm not quite sure where that resides right now because it, it's now commonplace to go to a pharmacy or whatever and be able to purchase. So I didn't know if there's any guidelines in manufacturing to be able to utilize that without being compliant to certain laws. Uh, so uh, hemp derived CBD is available for sale right now. You can yeah. get it on Amazon, eBay, you can go to certain health food stores. Cannabis derived CBD is not, not yet, unless you have a medical, unless you're a patient. So the, the hemp, and, and by the way, CBD from a hemp plant, CBD from the cannabis plant, they're the same thing. Cannabis and it, hemp, all hemp really is, is cannabis with 2.03 THC or less. It's the same plant, and that's what you were talking about impaired, impairment earlier, you know, in drug testing at the workplace and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, how am I as a patient able to perform all day long my job, and I, you know, I often talk to employers or, or, or politicians about this issue, and it's sort of like, if you're impaired, you're impaired, whether I took opioids, too much NyQuil that morning, whatever it is. So if I'm a cannabis patient, and I, and I have to perform my duties all day long, I'm going to take a very, very low THC and a high CBD to get me through the day. And I'm completely sober. I'm not impaired whatsoever. I'm performing the function of my job just as if I were taking some other thing like Advil, except it's healthier for me. So, so there's different types. So to go to the CBD, lots of people are using it. We use it for vitamins. You can buy vitamins. You can, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, medication or a vitamin equivalent. Down the road, what is the see big pharma and big tobacco and their involvement in this industry they're waiting in the wings it's, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're already they're already there it's the elephant in the back of the room over there what, what I would say is constellation brands which is the manufacturer of Coors beer they took a 250 million dollar interest in a company up in Canada uh, Alliance is a tobacco company they took a hundred million dollar interest in a company in Canada and the belief is they're buying their way to get a seat at the table to understand what's happening, how are they doing it, because they're betting it's going to come here and they're going to want the infrastructure and get all the kinks out before it's federally legal here, and then they're going to jump back in. So they're all all over it. And, and, and note the, the Canadian angle, right? I mean, because right now across Canada, all of Canada is, is uh, legal for medical marijuana, and soon this coming this summer, it's going to be all uh, legal for adult use. And so that, a lot of the investments and the research going in, yep. in the Canadian market. And on, on the satellite industries as well. I mean, back in April, uh, Scott's Miracle Grow bought a, a company yep. called Sunlight, yep. which is based out of uh, Vancouver, Washington, $450 million. Yep. They do lighting systems. Yep. They do water systems. They, they do infrastructure. They don't touch the plant. That's the point. Yep. But $450 million. It's not just the plant touching industries that, get, that are getting snapped up and, yep. and acquired and M&A action, it's on the, on the ancillary business side as well. Yep. To clarify the diversity part that you were just talking about, um, in Pennsylvania, if you have, you are all talking about building a team. I work for a woman-owned payroll company. Do you anticipate in New Jersey that those applying for licenses will also get extra points on their application, not if they themselves are diversity-owned 
but members of their ancillary services and their teams too? So at the federal level, I'll, I'll use that as an example. The, the answer to your question is unknown just yet. There's those regs and, and all those things are, would be still being developed. Um, but on, at the federal level, you see that. So in addition to being an elected official and all that stuff, I spent 13 years working for Lockheed Martin, who was a business development executive there, and we went after million and billion dollar programs, all of which had some sort of requirement for uh, historically disadvantaged business. So, and, and that was more of an objective. And, and again, it, it can't be a mandate in New Jersey. It's not constitutional. So what they're trying to do is, through language, is encourage it through, you know, encourage it by extra points or extra this or extra that to, to ensure that you are a diverse uh, organization. And I would encourage everybody to kind of figure that out because that is something that's going to be the standard. People are going to look to how I can differentiate myself. So it's whether it's a diversity model or coupled with some energy efficiencies or some very positive <coughs> environmental implications. So, so there's lots of things that people are going to be doing in their applications that's going to separate themselves from others. But almost everybody, if not everybody, is going to have a diversity model within their uh, portfolio. Hi there. I'm Beverly Thomas. I'm speaking for Baldwin and Obanoff, which is an agency in New Jersey, marketing agency. Um, you've made pretty clear that there are opportunities for the ancillary businesses. Mm -hmm. What are the risks regarding legal and financial or tax uh, law? There are many. <laughs> let's, let's start there. Um, in, in the marketing space, and I know there are some other folks from, from marketing agencies here in the room, you have to be very careful you know, on a couple different levels. I mean, especially on the marketing side, you, you can't advertise the use, sale, possession, distribution of an illicit substance. Now, short of that, what can you do? You can publish content-based information. You can use your website, perhaps, to educate people about other resources that are out there. Uh, you're, you're, it's going to matter very much on exactly what it is you're doing and, and what you hope to do is in the marketing space. But there is opportunity out there to participate in the industry. If you go online, you can see any number of websites right now, New Jersey, national, other states, that they aren't necessarily advertising anything for sale per se because they can't. But they are educating people. They post long-form content. They post news updates, so on and so forth. And then by way of their own network, they can help their business partners achieve what they want to achieve as well. It really does depend on exactly what you're doing or, or what you hope to do. So it's a, a fairly specific conversation pretty quickly, but that's it in a general sense. And from a financial perspective, you, your business is no different than ours. You're able to deduct all your expenses no different than an accounting firm or a law firm. So any, any revenue derived from that, all those expenses are deductible. And the only thing I would add to that too, it may, it may be covered, but uh, add to that too is if the bulk of your business is cannabis, even if it's an ancillary one, Banks may take a different look at you. It would be fine at the federal and the legal and all that stuff, but a bank may take, look at you a little bit differently. More questions? Just expand on that question again. Just repeat that. We have, we have a lot of small businesses here that are not going to set up, say, dispensaries themselves, but we want to sell products to that industry. Right. And services. Yep. We have to keep that separate from a tax perspective? No. No, as long as, <clears throat> as, long as you're not in the business touching the plant, anything related to touching the plant, that falls under 280E. As long as you're servicing companies and not touching the plant, not anything involved in that, all those expenses are deductible, no different than any other business. So if we look at the business of cannabis, it's really three industries in one. It's agriculture, it's manufacturing, and it's retail. Those are the primary three industries that all come together when you talk about a vertically integrated dispensary. Those are the three areas that, you know, that, that it covers. Ooh, I know we're, how are we doing on time? I'm a real estate and banking attorney, and I have a question. So if um, 
you have someone who wants to use the space, they want to be a tenant, and the property owner has financing, so they have a they have a loan in place, and there are certain covenants as to what the property is being used for, and it's in compliance with all law. All law is usually federal, state, local, etc. How do you get around that? And is that an issue as far as covenants? How do we, how do you put a tenant in the space? Is that what you're saying? Correct. Is, be is there a chilling effect for certain uh, properties? There, there may well be, sure. Because, listen, you can be in compliance with the law, which is the starting point, frankly. That's the floor. You're in compliance with the law. Now, in the situation that you have, you have, you have multiple layers of individuals or, or entities that are involved in this particular transaction or this situation, any one of which might have the ability or the power, given your contractual agreements up and down the chain, to say, I don't care if you're in compliance with the law. I don't want that space being used for that purpose. And, of course, that's their right if they control the property. So, so part of it is, you know, educating on the front end about potential uses of the property. When you first start into negotiations about leasing or buying or whatnot, and you have to communicate it up and down the chain of ownership, and it sounds like in your situation there's, there's a couple different layers, everybody has to be at the table. Everybody has to be involved. And from the start, ideally. And that's the way that you can work with each other and come to an agreement about, okay, here's what we intend to use the property for. Here are some other potential uses of the property even that, that we want to talk about with you now so that six months, 12 months from now, if we decide to convert some of the interior walls or whatnot and move into the cannabis space, we're not going to be precluded from doing so by our agreements. I mean, obviously, again, sort of like the prior question, it gets very specific very quickly. But in a general sense, you want the communication to be flowing among all the concerned actors, all the shareholders in any given property right from the start. In addition to that, so mortgage-free uh, buildings are obviously the best, right? So there's a bunch of those out there. But what you're also seeing is these REITs that are out there, so real estate investment trusts, they're buying and acquiring because you don't – so you don't have to go through the bank and traditional methods to, to get money loaned to you for your enterprise. They're going through REITs. So REITs are actually buying, and that's a very – very much an entrepreneurial area of the cannabis industry is to buy these properties and then you lease it back to a cannabis business. But even those people that do have those mortgages, do have those loans, they're still leasing to cannabis businesses, but they're typically charging a higher rate mm -hmm. on the cannabis tax. Yep. Um, so almost any part of the industry, uh, there's some some type of a cannabis tax, whether it's banking or whatever. So it's it's something that's available, but it's really the, the landowner that they're the building owner. More questions? What does the insurance industry say about cannabis? Um, they're still learning the industry, and they've got, obviously, the federal schedule one is an issue. Um, there are some insurance companies that are starting to insure the risk, and there's a number of different risks. Um, so it is, and, but again, like banking, it's expensive, you know, where there's, not, where there's very few you're going to pay a premium, but you are able to get insurance, and for whatever reason, I could you know, help you out with that. Let me know. Yeah, Veritas, we do have an insurance branch uh, because of the security risk management piece. You know, anything that we can't mitigate, we want to be able to have that insurance piece there for coverage. But uh, we do that aspect of benefits and crop protection and things like that. Okay, uh, we have time for one more question, and then we'll uh, wrap it up. We'll go to this gentleman right First and last. This is provisions in the bill regarding mail order so you could deliver within the state from, let's say, South Jersey to North Jersey? Not yet. And the second part is, can't my existing company buy a building or be the renter of the building, which will be deductible for my current company, and then sublet it out or have it being used for the cannabis side? Just a thought. Uh, well, I'll answer the question on the delivery part. Uh, the answer is no right now. Um, there's nothing in there now. There's not. And, and quite frankly, when we talk about delivery, to talk about delivery is very important. You know, I can, I can be a patient and have morphine delivered in my house in a paper bag from the local CVS, but if I want to get cannabis sent to me and I'm in a wheelchair, I can't. So, so there, we're, we're, you know, that's a big heated discussion as how to get that, make that available to patients in particular. Um, but yeah, so and then on the banking and the building side of it, uh, does anyone handle the? Uh... Just, just repeat that question again. I have a business, and my business would buy the building 
Right. Which has current revenue, current employees. And then have the cannabis side as being on the bottom level, yep. 100%. And the cannabis side rents it for me. Yep. I have to be the landlord. Mm-hmm. Yep. A couple of different opportunities that you have there. You know, when we're, we've got it in the same building, we can allocate some cost and maybe get some of those non deductible expenses over to the deductible side. So, what we recommend is you don't just manufacture the cannabis. There's other things. If you're going to touch the plant, there's other things around it we want to do. So, even if I can take 10% of those non deductible costs and make an argument, they're over here, it's, it's a significant tax savings. Is, is there anything in the building? No consumption on the property yeah. for now. A medical patient, okay, a medical patient can can use their medical marijuana wherever you're allowed to consume a cigarette. So, for example, if you're not allowed to smoke right. indoors, right. you can't smoke cannabis indoors, right. but you could take an oil, you could take other things indoors. But if that's, if that's you know, so, so migraines. So migraine headaches is a debilitating thing for lots of people, and the fastest way to get rid of that migraine by far is inhaling cannabis. And so that gets rid of it almost right away. So that's something you can step outside of where you're allowed to right, sm- right. smoke cigarettes. It's sort of like a winery. They've got some winery outside or inside. And it's just something cannabis have a uh, cannabis side and a porch area if they want to consume it. And can talk sure. So we're going to close now. So what I want to do is just give our, our panel an opportunity to just say a couple closing remarks, and then, then we'll kick off. Sure. Again, thanks for coming out. I mean, a big part of the effort right now in the state and a big part of the effort in getting this industry online and up and running and out of the shadows, frankly, are these sorts of events. People from professional walks of life of every kind, every business coming together, trying to understand exactly what it is that's going on, where the holes in their own knowledge are, where the opportunities are, and then what they can do if they choose to, to advocate for the development of the industry. It's great to see everybody here. I think somebody mentioned at the beginning that you know, at a prior conference they were at, the room was half the size. The same is true for me. And, and Scott and I have been kind of doing this kind of thing for about a year now. And it started with a meeting of about 45 people, and we have 200-something here now today. Uh, it's coming. It's something not to be feared. We need to learn about it. We need to get ready for it. And if you're so inclined, there are opportunities that you can use to take advantage of it. So thanks very much. Uh, Scott, just wanted to thank yourself and NJ Biz and my fellow panelists and the audience. You guys were a great audience today. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, clearly, there's a lot of momentum. We're really excited about uh, about where we see the industry heading. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, again, do your research. Educate yourself. Do not shortcut it. You will be in for a huge surprise. Invest the time. Do it right. Get out and advocate for it. More people, the stigma. Um, needs to go away and people need to understand the medical side and, and the, the positive components and we got to get away from all the negativity that we've been taught growing up and get involved, get involved politically, get involved on an advocate basis and you know, together I think everyone's going to be able to make a difference in this. We are, we are very excited about New Jersey coming online here um, and I hope you guys are as excited as we are. But before it comes online, get started. Build those teams, make those connections. Uh, we, can't, we can't beat that horse enough. You know, um, get into the towns, make that, those connections at the, at, at the municipal level um, because once, uh, once it starts, it's going to almost be too late. So um, make it happen. I hope we'll see you in a couple months. Thanks, Thanks Jim. And, and, uh, and, and thank you, Howard, and the entire NJ Biz family for more info. Oh, and Howard's going to come up and, and do the closing thing. All right, so for more information on how to get involved, feel free to give me a call, NewJerseyCannabusiness.com. And Howard, come on up. Thank you very much, everybody. I want to thank our panel. This was a really enlightening and informative panel. And let's please give them a round of applause. So next week's issue of NJ Biz will have a very heavy component to the marijuana cannabis subject in it. So I urge you to get a copy of NJ Biz. And in fact, you can sign up for a free trial subscription on the way out with Anna Aquaviva, who helped set up this event. So that's Anna waving over there. So please uh, see her. And uh, our next panel session will be in June, and it will be on the topic of energy. And we look forward to 
having all of you come to that event as well. Thank you so much for coming, and have a good day. Thank you.